500 millibits. This, to me, feels like the future. 1,000 millibits at 8 It's going to change the way that humans interact as a race. There are an increasing number of people who recognize the potential of the platform. With the click of a button, they can send money. This isn't a revival, it's a gathering of the Bitcoin faithful. As an idea, Bitcoin makes sense to me. You can make money. It's something that I stumbled upon on the internet. I tripled my money. I'll pay $7.95 on a thousand millibits. Come on, someone. Imagine a world without cash. These people aren't just fantasizing about it, they're living it. Welcome to the world of digital currencies, where Bitcoin, not cash, is king. Depending on where you stand on cryptocurrencies, this could be the future of money or a speculative bubble that looks a lot like the days of dot-com. Behind the Bitcoin uprising, a belief Bitcoin will disrupt the global financial system giving consumers a faster and for now cheaper way to send money around the globe, all without the oversight of a central bank. I thought it was really interesting to see people take currency back. Your 570 Bitcoin believers placing their trust in the math protecting and directing the Bitcoin system, not in God or a government. But what exactly is Bitcoin? The creation of a mysterious person or group called Satoshi Nakamoto, Bitcoin can be difficult to understand. It's a digital currency created by computers and stored online. You can't hold it in your hand. Computers called miners produce Bitcoin every 10 minutes by solving complex math problems. Once mined, Bitcoin can be sent instantly anywhere in the world from one digital wallet to another. Transactions are nearly anonymous, as wallets are identified only by a string of digits, not a name. And to keep the players honest, each transaction is assigned a number, posted, and then verified on a public open source ledger called a blockchain. Supply is fixed at 21 million Bitcoin, and it's the miners, not central banks, that manage supply. So far, 12.5 million Bitcoin have been mined, worth over $6 billion. But who decides what a Bitcoin is worth? The people, buyers and sellers, name the price. For many, Bitcoin's technology may be tough to grasp, but it's been eagerly embraced by some high-profile investors like Silicon Valley's Mark Andreessen. But it's a huge opportunity, um, and everybody has the opportunity. Bitcoin's an open technology. It's open source. It's freely available. Anybody can participate. John, I'm with the uh, Texas Bitcoin Association. Jonathan Rumian is not your run-of-the-mill Bitcoin enthusiast. Why do we have a decentralized currency with centralized exchanges? This computer whiz kid who started coding at the age of 12 and completed college while still in his teens sees Bitcoin as a once-in-a-generation opportunity. You said Bitcoin is going to be as big as the Internet. If someone looks at it at face value and says, all I see is a digital currency, other than disrupting the payment mechanism that we have around the world, how is it going to be bigger than the Internet? Um, well, a lot of people see Bitcoin um, you know, like a currency. Some people see it as a commodity. I just see it as a payment network and as a network for um, transmitting information um, so that we can agree on a piece of information uh, globally. Um, and that has never been possible before. In other words, Bitcoin's um, public ledger could timestamp, track, and verify digitized contracts, including mortgages, deeds, wills, and stock certificates, eliminating the middleman. It's not going to happen overnight, but I mean, this is a day-by-day -day process. Like many other Bitcoin believers, Rumian is an under-35 software developer, but slightly different in that he also works for a Bitcoin startup. They can trade that on a market. Invests in Bitcoin and gets paid in Bitcoin. No, I can't claim that Bitcoin is this new big, great big thing if I'm not willing to take the risk myself. It's a risk that so far is paying off. I think my best earning was $1,000 over 10 minutes, um, just on a quick trade and a phone call. And he's not alone. After years of little growth, Bitcoin's price took off in April of 2013, when the Cyprus financial crisis sent citizens scrambling for another place to put their money. Many put it in Bitcoin. The result? Bitcoin's value skyrocketed, compared to a respectable return of 105% in Facebook stock last year. Bitcoin surged 55 times that up over 5,400 percent. 
This sparked a media frenzy and retailers took notice, seeing a chance to cash in on the craze. Tens of thousands of them, from gun shops to groceries to CheapAir.com. We started accepting Bitcoin in November and we, we've probably sold, you know, very roughly 2,000 tickets. The tickets are paid for in Bitcoin, CheapAir is not. Customers pay us in Bitcoin, but then we use a processor and it's exchanged for dollars pretty much immediately. We didn't have to change all of our systems to handle a different currency. Once the sale comes in, after about five minutes within our system, you can't distinguish between whether it was Bitcoin or credit card or some other form of payment. As more retailers accept Bitcoin payments, Rumian's faith in the cryptocurrency is reaffirmed. So what made you a believer then? Because now I can actually use it. I mean, back when Bitcoin was a dollar and ten dollars, um, I couldn't buy a plane ticket. I couldn't get a hotel room with Bitcoin. I couldn't do my grocery shopping with Bitcoin. And that's exactly what Rumian and his girlfriend Jamie do now, sort of. But how do you do it here at Whole Foods? Because Whole Foods doesn't take Bitcoin, does it? No, they don't. Um, I have this app on my phone um, called Gift. And Gift is a gift card uh, application. And I can buy my gift cards with Bitcoin through Gift. It's twenty five eighty seven. And then I can get my groceries, I can get my books, go to Target. Pretty much anything that I would do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis I can get done. I mean, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Economist Justin Wolfers focuses on social and policy happens, and behavioral classes. economics. And He's not buying into Bitcoin because it's just too difficult to use. The advocates think that regular people should adopt it. I don't see any need to. I walk to the stores. The stores accept my U.S. dollars. The monetary system is working perfectly okay for me right now. Among Bitcoin's other critics, billionaire investor Warren Buffett. The Oracle of Omaha sees potential value in Bitcoin's technology. It's a very effective way of transmitting money, and you can do it anonymously and all that. But little it's in its potential as an investment. It's a mirage, basically. The idea that it has some huge intrinsic value is just a joke, in my view. The response from Bitcoin's high-profile investor, Andreessen? Buffett is just plain out of touch. The historical track record of old white men who don't understand technology, crapping on new technology, is, I think, at 100 percent. Coming up... Amid the public debate about Bitcoin's future, there's a shadowy group that's embraced it. Online drug dealers, counterfeiters, even hitmen, all being paid in Bitcoin. I fundamentally believe it is being used primarily for illegal activities. We look at the flip side, the dark side of Bitcoin. In the last year, Bitcoin's grabbed headlines, as much for the meteoric rise in its price as for its link to the online underworld and crimes, including fraud, Ponzi schemes, and outright theft. The dark web is full of vendors who accept only exclusively Bitcoin. Former assistant U.S. attorney Donya Perry is talking about an online haven for criminals that's rarely seen by everyday users of the internet. The dark web shining unwanted light on Bitcoin last fall, when the Fed shut down the notorious online black market bazaar called Silk Road. Over a two and a half year period, it allegedly sold $1.2 billion worth of cocaine, LSD, fake credit cards, licenses, and other illegal goods, all paid for with Bitcoin. Silk Road was really the prototype. I, I believe I've heard the statistic that 20% of all narcotics transactions over the past, say, two years were conducted uh, through Silk Road. 29-year-old Ross Ulbrich, a graduate school dropout, allegedly ran Silk Road. He has pled not guilty to multiple counts, including drug trafficking and money laundering. But Ulbrich's lawyers call the money laundering charges invalid saying there's no actual money involved. Bitcoin's definition poses a challenge to attorneys prosecuting Bitcoin-related crimes. Is it a commodity, a currency, or property, as the IRS claims? These questions hover over law enforcement as they pursue criminal activity on the dark web, where Silk Road might just be the tip of the iceberg. Fake IDs, here we have the Hitman Network, 
this is a gun dealer. It says right here, how can I pay? For payment, we prefer bitcoins. You must use a bitcoin wallet to make payment for our service. It, it seems to be the wave of the future. It's, Perry, it's who prosecuted easier, hundreds of sophisticated white-collar fraud and money laundering cases, points out using bitcoin can be more alluring to criminals than cash. There is their anonymity, which of course uh, makes them attractive to people who wish to cloak themselves in secrecy. That anonymity and the new technology posing new challenges for law enforcement. I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say that it's not difficult with this whole new dark web world that we now live in. Um, and there are so many different ways to make transactions more secretive, and it's that much harder for law enforcement to keep up. Yet here in the U.S., crime fighters have taken down a Bitcoin-based Ponzi scheme in Texas and busted up what authorities say was a Bitcoin-based money laundering operation in Miami. Bitcoin transactions take place online. Most are unregulated. There is no exchange of bills, bank account information, or credit card numbers. Moved between digital wallets on your computer or smartphone, Bitcoin transactions are identified only by a unique string of numbers that generally reveals nothing about the buyers and sellers' names or locations. Once sent, Bitcoin are gone for good. That can be a great tool for fraudsters in the pyramid scheme sense, or hackers who hack into uh, your com computer and are able to get your code. Jennifer Shasky is with the Treasury's uh, crime the fighting Bitcoin unit. She highlights Bitcoin. another major problem with Bitcoin. So if a hacker gets your uh, private key, they're able to take your Bitcoin and you can't get it back. So not only is Bitcoin the currency of choice on the dark web, but investors and everyday users are vulnerable too because Bitcoin held in digital wallets or on exchanges can be easy marks for cyber thieves. Today, there are challenges in storing Bitcoin for anyone. The security risks are real. Jim Harper is a global policy counsel for the advocacy group, the Bitcoin Foundation. Uh, the protections are still coming online. It's early yet, but we'll find that Bitcoin is as secure as cash. In the meantime, investors can still lose hundreds of millions in Bitcoin, as they did with Mt. Gox. Tokyo-based Mt. Gox, once one of the largest Bitcoin exchanges, has disappeared. In February, what was once the world's largest Bitcoin exchange shut down. Investors claim they were defrauded when Mt. Gox said it lost 850,000 Bitcoin, which was worth nearly half a billion dollars at the time. Mt. Gox CEO Mark Carpellis blamed the loss on a flaw in the digital currency's code. People really want to know what happened. We had a problem with a system that caused a loss to our, uh, because to our customers. And we uh, have identified the problem we are working on this. Investors claim Mt. Gox failed to secure its system. They haven't answered anybody's uh, support requests. Allegations of incompetence reinforced weeks later when Mt. Gox stumbled upon 200,000 of the lost Bitcoin. We still have even Bitcoin. Mt. Gox saying it was sitting in a forgotten digital wallet, which is kind of like a Bitcoin bank account. But unlike a real bank account, it's not protected leaving investors holding the bag. Coming up next... We have two computers running everything. Capitalizing on Bitcoin, the legal way. How much does he pay you for this space? When the lights go on in the Vitado household, it's time to rise and shine. There's some more eggs. You can have eggs if you want. And mine for Bitcoin. Is there a reason it's better in the basement as opposed to up on the main floor? It's uh, less of a nuisance to the family because it's very loud. 31-year-old Steve Vitado first heard of Bitcoin two years ago. A friend of mine said, uh, this is crazy and I'm all in. And that was my introduction to Bitcoin. At the time, Vitado was living in England and was a civilian employee for the Department of Defense. It was difficult to buy them, but you could gamble them, and I like to gamble them. Now working at home as a programmer for a cybersecurity firm, Vitado gave up online gambling when he and his family moved to Valparaiso, Indiana last year. We have two computers running everything. Uh, Though Vitado still bets on Bitcoin with a mini mining operation he set up in his basement for him and a partner. 
What's your monthly electricity bill now? <laughs> Didido provides the power. It was close to $500, and that's when we had most of these black ones online, not quite all of them, and it's going to be continuing to climb. His partner provides most of the computers. They cost between $1,500 to $5,000 and will likely become obsolete in about two years. How much does he pay you for this space? Do you mind me asking? When it was just the black boxes, it was $1,000 a month, and then I charged $250 for each of these other big ones. Part of a digital gold rush, Fitido is one of an unknown number of miners around the world. He wields computers, not picks and shovels, in a quest for digital riches. The rush is a race dictated by Bitcoin's programming code. Its aim? To mine all the 21 million Bitcoin the program will generate by 2140. I've gotten more out than I've put into it. The computers or miners compete to solve complex math problems. The first to solve a problem gets a fixed amount of Bitcoin that's distributed every 10 minutes. The digital booty is then divvied up among the computer's owners, like Vitido. If I'm looking at all these machines together, how many Bitcoins will they produce in a month? All of these together, including those over here, will produce about 1.2 Bitcoins a day. In other words, if Bitcoin trades for $600, that's $720 worth of Bitcoin a day, or $262,000 a year. But that's a big if, given the big swings in Bitcoin's price. Why pay $600 for Bitcoin? Maybe you think it will upend global finance with cheaper, faster money transfers. Or you love it because it's controlled by a computer program, not a central bank. Or maybe you think it's a fad where you can make a quick buck. If I can get in at the right time and get out at the right time, uh, you know, I've, I've made money on it. Boy, I wish this were real money. After expenses, including electricity and the cost of the computers, Vitido's minority share of the mining operation generates less than 5% of his family's income. When I was doing very well with Bitcoin and I uh, cashed them out early, I, um, I paid for my son's schooling with it. So I spent $5,000 on a private school for my son. He claims the profits as hobby income on his taxes. And while Vitido firmly believes in the security of the Bitcoin code, he's less certain about the virtual currency's future. The economists that have looked at it, they've um, they said this is a bubble and it has all the characteristics of the bubble and I, you know, I believe them. That doesn't mean you can't profit from a bubble. 1,100 miles south in Austin, Texas. Temperature sensors on each um, aisle now. Emmanuel Abiodun and his partners are also profiting from mining Bitcoin. We've never had this kind of um, financial revolution that we've needed in hundreds of years. We've had revolutions with the internet, we've had everything, but we've never had something with regards to money. Abby Odin is CEO of a mega mining firm called Cloud Hashing. This year alone, the former programmer for JP Morgan expects Cloud Hashing's nearly 3,000 computers in Dallas and Iceland to produce $100 million worth of Bitcoin. Right now, Bitcoin mining is profitable at the price of $600 a Bitcoin. At $200 a Bitcoin, we're still profitable. The company is less than two years old, and it became a big business based on a simple premise. Clients buy contracts ranging from $1,000 to $1.5 million, and in return, get a cut of the Bitcoin mined. We have customers who are essentially high net worth individuals who just don't have the time or have the expertise to be able to manage it. We have businesses, business owners. Cloud hashing is one of the hundreds of startups that are part of the Bitcoin uprising, a revolution Abby Odin didn't buy into at first. I thought Bitcoin was a scam back then. <laughs> <laughs> what changed your mind? I looked at the code, and from that point, I just deemed this thing is solid. This is well written. I mean, this thing is going to really solve a lot of problems. We assign you a certain amount of hashing power based on the contract you purchase. Along with mining, the program offers cloud hashing another way to make money processing Bitcoin payments. You're the middleman. We're the middleman. If you have a Bitcoin account, or Bitcoin wallet as it's, as it's called, for you to send a payment to somebody else, someone, a miner needs to process that. Now, when you make that payment, you have the option as a, as a payer to add a fee to that, to pretty much you know, facilitate the transaction or to encourage me to process your payment faster. Right now, those fees are low, lower than a credit card payment or a money transfer. It's a big reason so many love the idea of Bitcoin. The challenge? Keep the fees low in the face of higher costs, 
like the power to run the computers and potential regulation, which Abby Odin thinks is needed to get more people to use Bitcoin. Probably people will want to stone me for saying that, but I do believe the lack of regulation is holding a lot of money on the sidelines. If people have a clear path to what exactly they can or cannot do, what the tax implications is or isn't, then they're more inclined to make a decision on purchasing or not purchasing. This new age currency may need to bend to old world rules to gain greater acceptance today. This is a global phenomenon. Businesses can deal with regulation. What business can't deal with is uncertainty. We'll have that story coming up next. Anybody sell it? It does not meet the test of a currency. As a currency, it's beautiful. It's not a store of value. It's a great store of value. There is a battle waging. And Barry Silbert, a Bitcoin investor, is on the front line. His mission? Open a Bitcoin exchange and do it fast. As Wall Street and financial institutions look to get involved in the space, they really need to be able to tap into an exchange that's set up in a way that is known and trusted to them. Silbert's moving fast because Bitcoin's price has skyrocketed. With over $6 billion worth of Bitcoin out there, investors are buying in, and businesses like Silbert's want to help them grow their stash and spend their riches. I believe that this is the year of Wall Street with Bitcoin. Silbert earned his street cred as CEO of Second Market, an online platform that trades yeah. illiquid assets. More recently, he and his partners launched the Bitcoin Investment Trust, a kind of Bitcoin mutual fund for high net worth clients. In the four months since launch, the BITS assets under management have grown to over 70,000 Bitcoin, which is approximately $60 million at today's price. Now he set his sights on opening the first regulated Bitcoin exchange here in the U.S., even though regulation isn't always welcome in the world of Bitcoin. Regulation gives some people a sense that they're in a secure environment, but to others, regulation signals that the environment is unsafe. Jim Harper advocates for the Bitcoin Foundation, where he juggles the conflicting agendas of the Bitcoin faithful. On one hand, he represents the interests of entrepreneurs like Silbert. I used to think that government intervention or uh, incumbent banks pushing back was going to stifle the growth and the innovation, and actually I'm seeing the quite, quite the opposite. On the other hand, Harper must defend the interests of investors like Mike Robinson, who bought into Bitcoin because there is no regulation. I'd say the threat comes more from governments. Bitcoin's mysterious creator never intended a government to get involved. It's Bitcoin's programming code that controls supply, not a central bank. Payments are made anonymously, quickly, and can be sent anywhere around the world without a middleman like a bank. I'm concerned. Uh, other countries are ahead of the curve uh, by already issuing regulations to protect their citizens. So what are governments doing? China bans banks from dealing in it. Russia bans it outright. Iceland and Vietnam say it's illegal. Japan says it's not a currency. Germany taxes some Bitcoin transactions. And Brazil will regulate it. In the U.S., it will be taxed as property. The Federal Reserve simply does not have authority to supervise or regulate Bitcoin. The Federal Reserve may be on the sidelines, but the head of New York's Department of Financial Services is not. When it comes to virtual currencies, let's admit it, regulators, all of us, are in new and somewhat uncharted waters. Ben Losky However, is at the forefront of Bitcoin regulation here in the U.S., holding hearings with the Bitcoin the community and working on new laws so Bitcoin businesses um, can prosper in his state. Losky sees Bitcoin's promise. It potentially can significantly reduce uh, fraud, like credit card fraud, because you don't have a third party intermediary for these transactions taking your personal data. Uh, it can t potentially bring the costs of transactions uh, way, way down. Losky also sees its peril. So we have to really be on our toes in, in terms of making sure uh, it doesn't become a safe haven for terrorists and money launderers. The people who are going to eventually really get upset with it will be governments. Jamie Dimon is the CEO of J.P. Morgan. It's one of the country's largest banks. He doesn't think Bitcoin could survive if it's subjected to the same anti-money laundering rules as his company. That will probably be the end of it. And those are fighting words to the people behind the Bitcoin uprising. 
When people in positions of high authority, people who are, are very successful in the status quo, question Bitcoin, that's actually sort of a form of encouragement to the Bitcoin community because we see a different world in the future. How long do you think it's going to take? Between 10 and 50 years is what I'm thinking. And the fact that Bitcoin got a lot of interest in the early years uh, doesn't tell us how long it's going to take to adopt. Ultimately, Bitcoin's future probably lies in your hands, not those of its early adopters. Will its promise of faster transactions, lower fees, and freedom from central bankers be enough to convince all of us that a cashless society and virtual currencies like Bitcoin are the way of the future? I'm Mary Thompson. Thanks for watching.